welcome to the Wednesday night service tonight. We're doing this in the lobby uh, because they're still working on the coolers in the auditorium, and it is 87 degrees in there. I think I got it cooled down one degree to 86, and so we just moved everything in here tonight. And I want to say thank you to everyone that participated a little earlier this evening in the drive-by birthday parade for Miss Mary. Made her day. She said it was the best birthday she's had in years. So thank you for doing that. And that wasn't only ministering to her, but it's ministering to Miss Laura Bruce, who's in the hospital. And uh, thank you for doing that and being a part of that. We're going to ask you to join us tonight. Number 43, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood.
words of the song. I was mixing up the uh, chorus all over the place there, and so I know that had to throw yes. Jim, Jonathan off, but uh, if you have a prayer request, please, if you would, just kind of share it uh, in the comment section. I will share one with you. Um, if you would pray for my niece, Hillary Blastop. This is the, uh, she married one of my nephews, she married Jacob, and Jacob and Josh are the ones with cystic fibrosis, both of whom have adopted little girls. We're very grateful for that. Right after Jacob and Hillary were married, Hillary had a severe car accident. Right before, right before their marriage, they had, Hillary had a severe uh, car accident, and uh, so she's still been battling some things, and one of the things that she's struggling with is her eye, I forget which one it is, it's her left eye. Um, her cornea blew up in her left eye, and they have decided to take her left eye out. That happens tomorrow. So if you would pray for uh, Jacob and Hillary Blastock, pray for my sister Shireen and her husband Dan, as that's uh, just a, a tremendous situation. Also pray for my brother and my sister and brother-in-law, their church, uh, where they're meeting, they put the property up for sale, and uh, they need to raise the money to be able to buy it. Uh, I believe, if I remember right, they're they're being offered the opportunity to buy it at half of the market value, but it's still a lot of money. So pray for them that they could do that. I'm seeing a number of prayer requests coming in. Mrs. Keel is asking us to pray for her joint pain. Um, Miss Lori Reed has an unspoken. Brandon Nikonowitz has an unspoken. Uh, pray for Kate Keene. She's having some health issues. Pray for uh, Elias. I guess that's how it is. Huh? Elise? Uh, Jacquez. Uh, he's got uh, she. she has. Okay, if I would read the whole thing. It's, he it's Miss Heather's sister in law. Uh, she has ulcerative colitis and uh, it's very severe and she's in constant pain. She's only 26 years old, so uh, we want to pray for Elise. Um, so let me do this. Let me pray for these that I see right now. And if more come in while I'm praying, we'll pray for those in a moment. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, tonight we come into your presence and we are very thankful for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to just be a blessing to the Bruce family today, we do pray for Miss Laura. We pray that you put your healing hand upon her, that you raise her up. She hopes to get to come home from tomorrow, uh, tomorrow from the hospital. They still don't have any real answers. I pray you give the doctors wisdom, give them answers, and that, they, that she can get on the road to recovery. Lord, we pray for Hillary, who's going to be having the surgery tomorrow. And Lord, uh, I can't even imagine what uh, what's involved in this situation but the decision is made to take her eye out her left eye we ask you to be with her we ask you to put your hand upon her we guide the doctors and the nurses throughout this procedure lord give her grace during this time and, and just lift, lift her up to you lord pray for my brother-in-law and sister dan and shereen and their church their lord and, and Cristobal, lord and, and uh, i know that they have a desire to see people saved and and, and Lord, they've got an opportunity to buy this property and they're having trouble getting the money together and if they don't find the financing, they'll be out of this property on the 30th of June. We ask you to intervene. We ask you to work, Lord, and just bless and meet each need, Father. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Mrs. Kill with her pain, Lord, that she's experiencing her, experiencing in her joints. Just strengthen her and help her, Lord, if you would. And, and then, Lord, if you would be with uh, Brandon and Gloria, both of them have an unspoken prayer request. We ask you to work in that situation and ask you to just meet each need there, Lord. And uh, we ask you to guide and direct there, Lord. We pray for Elise, this young lady that's having a real problem with the ulcerative colitis, Lord. We ask you to, to put your hand upon her, Lord. I'm asking you for a number of different reasons to show yourself strong in that family. That they would see that you are, in fact, God, that you are, in fact, in charge of every circumstance, Lord, and, and I pray that you would be exalted and lifted up. And I ask you to work and I ask you to, to be with this young lady and just strengthen her and, and, and work strongly on her behalf, Lord, that they might see what a great God you are, Lord. Father, thank you for meeting each need. Uh, 
Lord, I pray that you just continue to bless and guide and help us give us wisdom over these next three days as we get ready for services in the building. We've got a lot of work to do. Lord, I pray that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I see here Miss Zoe is saying that uh, surgery, her, her grandpa had surgery today, uh, and it went well. And so uh, she is, uh, he is in a four-week uh, recovery stage, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, she's asking to pray that his arm heals well, so we will, uh, we will do that. And uh, so, is your feet still going? Mm -hmm. Okay, mine froze for some reason, but that's all right. Um, so, hopefully it'll kick back in here in a moment. So, uh, let's pray for Doug uh, Brian, Lord, that, that, that tonight that his arm will heal from the surgery. So, let's pray for him very quickly. Father, thank you for bringing uh, Brother Doug through this surgery. Lord, and now he's in this four-week uh, stage. We ask you to be with him and help him, Lord and uh, meet each need, Lord, and, and we ask you to work in his life, help his arm to heal, Lord. I pray for Pat and Ken Curry. Uh, Lord, both of them have heart issues and, and, and some procedures coming up, Lord. And, and uh, just my wife and I were talking about it last night. She was, she was mentioning to me that they both have some issues with their heart. And just two, a day and a half ago or so, so, they were outside mowing their lawn. They've got three acres, and they were just taking care of their lawn and stuff. Or just... Put your hand on this couple, Lord. They've been so faithful to serve you over the years. Been such an encouragement to my wife and I. Uh, Lord, bless them and, and, and work through these situations that they're having done, Lord. And, and be with the doctors and guide and direct, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Mrs. Natalia is praying for remaining healing for her old husband. So I guess Brother Josh is in pain or something. I don't know. So we'll pray. Let's pray for Brother Josh. Father, we pray for Brother Josh tonight. I ask you to just bless him, heal him, and strengthen him as he gets ready to go back to the academy. We pray that you guide and direct through the police academy. We pray that you guide and direct your perfect will in his life as to where you want him to go after that. Lord, we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Sunday morning we'll begin our services in the building and so we're going to be um, 8 30 10 o'clock and 11 30 and uh, we started out by dividing you up according to the groups that we had with our Sunday school campaign for Chevy and Dodge we have had to tweak that a little bit because we're trying to also group some families together uh, that will help the seating arrangements and what have you. And so you're no longer Ford, Chevy, and Dodge for the Sunday morning services. You're going to be Group A, B, and C. And I need to get that information to you, so I will try to finish everything up so we can have that for you tomorrow. If you would do this, it would be a tremendous help to me. If you would be willing to come by tomorrow evening between 5.30 and 6.30 and pick that up here at the church. That would save me a lot of time and a lot of effort. I have got, and I'm not complaining, folks. I'm, I'm excited. I'm so excited about getting back into our building. I uh, had a conversation yesterday, yesterday evening through text with the police, uh, with our police captain, our chief, Chief Sever, and uh, he's, you know, we're, we're, we're in great shape. We're moving forward. I'm excited about it, but it would help me. I've got a lot to do in the next three days to make sure we're ready for Sunday morning. It would help me if you would come by tomorrow night 
uh, between 5.30 and 6.30 and pick those up. That would be a blessing to me. It would be a help if you'd be willing to do that. Also, if you would be willing to help on Saturday with some cleaning, we need to make sure the auditorium is clean. We need to make sure the restrooms are clean. We have our sprayer here, um, and we need to get that figured out what we're going to do so we can sanitize everything that came today. And so there's just a lot of work there to be done. And so if you can help me with any of that, if you would let me know, I would greatly appreciate it. Make sure when you find out what service you're in, make sure that you are here early. We will have a lineup situation. We'll keep families about six feet apart. We will have people screening um, and our Thermometers will be here on Saturday, uh, and so we will be screening. We will be asking you a few questions. Uh, we're not keeping records of it. We're just going to check things off real quick, uh, and, and then we'll let you go in, and then ushers will seat you. Uh, and so please uh, help us by doing that. Some of you have already contacted me. I had somebody contact me today. They're looking to have a couple of visitors with them Sunday. Praise the Lord. We have space for visitors. So we'll be fine with that area. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. And so hopefully uh, we'll have some visitors on Sunday. And, and uh, Miss Hannah will be contacting some people, I'm guessing. Uh, she's looking at me like, what are you talking about? But uh, about solos. We've got a number of solos, two basically in each group. And so you'll be singing every, every other week. And so uh, she'll be letting you know about that. Some of you will be, Miss Celine will be playing for you. That will be exciting. That will be great. And uh, so uh, I'm excited about this. We've got three services Sunday morning. Then Sunday night, one group, will, we've got you divided into two groups. One group will be here Sunday night. Group two will be watching on live stream. And then next Wednesday night, group two will be in the auditorium. And group one will be home live streaming. And we'll do that. And we're doing this about six weeks. Uh, and then we're going to start slowly opening this thing up even more. So I'm excited about that. You'll be praying for that, and uh, the services, all the services, will be live streamed. We've got a new camera in. Trying to learn how to do that. There's just a lot that I'm learning. Uh, if somebody knows some things about cameras and media and that sort of thing, and you want to come down tomorrow and help me, I would be glad to have the help. Because I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning. So if you'd help me, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, the other thing tonight, just on the offerings, uh, folks, I... I I don't know how to say thank you other than just to say thank you. You have been so faithful with your offerings. Our offerings have done well throughout this time. And I appreciate it. I appreciate your faithfulness online, watching the services and, and being faithful to the giving. Uh, it has made us get through this in excellent fashion. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I talked with Brother Stansel yesterday uh, about the offering that we're giving to him going to try again tomorrow to go by the bank and just deposit it for him, but he wanted to say thank you. He wanted me to tell you how much he appreciated uh, what we're doing and what we've been able to do for our evangelists. So thank you so much for what you're doing and all that you're doing. Let's stay at it. Let's keep, let's stay faithful. Pray. I'm going to do a, a video tonight uh, on, on Facebook to just advertise the fact that we're going back and I'll boost that so it'll get out. And so there's still a lot of work to be done, but keep us in prayer. And uh, let's trust the Lord for a great day on Sunday. Brother Jonathan, you come 155. Have thine own way, Lord. Song number 155, Have Thine Own Way. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse this evening. Song number 155. Join me on the first verse.
in our life. If you have your Bible tonight, turn to Psalm 9. We kind of got away from the Psalms a little bit, getting ready for this Sunday, and I hope you're excited about Sunday. I know I am, um, and uh, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a great day. And uh, so Psalm 9 tonight, and uh, Brother Mio is here tonight, and he's given me some homework. Uh, he's given me a little slip of paper of asking me a lot of these things that are mentioned in the titles uh, of the uh, of the Psalms, and there's one here tonight. Uh, but uh, notice the title says, To the Chief Musician Upon Mucklaven, and I probably pronounced that wrong, but that's as close as I can get. That, I'm not, they're not sure what that is. Some people you read says that's a musical instrument, others you say it's not. Uh, it is, it translates, the phrase is death of the sun. Why that's, why that's attached to this psalm, we're not 100% sure. There's nothing in the psalm that indicates exactly what's going on. David does take time in this psalm to talk about his enemies. And he asks the Lord to work in, in the situation with his enemies. Much of the psalm is that way. We're only going to read verses 7 through 16 tonight because in the midst of this, of David asking God to work on his enemies, David deals with the subject of judgment, the judgment of God. That is not a subject that people like to think about. The idea that God would judge. People have this idea that God is just all love, and God is love. It's not just that God loves, God is love. The Bible says that God is love. But it's not, there's more to God than just the fact that God loves. Let, let me illustrate it for you before we read the scripture. Think about the cross. And when we think about the cross, we that are saved often think about the love that God has for us and how that God displayed his love for us on the cross. Do we not? And that's a, that's a good thought. Did not Jesus say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's talking about the cross. But when we also look at the cross, we see the love of God. But I will remind you, we also see the judgment of God at the cross. Because at the cross, God judged all of our sin. Colossians 1.14 puts it this way, that he blotted out the ordinances that was against us. So at the same time, in one sin, we see the love of God, but we see the judgment of God. And folks, we need to understand something tonight. God is not done with this issue of judgment. We live in an age of grace, and God has been very gracious to us, to our families. He's been very gracious to our country. But that doesn't mean that God will not judge us if necessary. So look with me, if you would, in verses 7 through 16 tonight. Where David says, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall utter, he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time, in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble when, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. That I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid for in the, is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion Selah. Let's pray. Father, tonight, would you bless now this message? Would you speak to our hearts? Lord, would you help us to understand this very important 
subject that is often overlooked, and that's the issue of your judgment. Lord, you are a gracious God, and you are a merciful God, but there are times when you act in judgment. May we understand that tonight. And Lord, may we have a, a, a proper respect for your judgment that we might live right and we might do right because of our respect for your judgment. Bless the message tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So David in verses 1 through 6 is, is praying about uh, his enemies. He picks up that theme again in verse 15 and verse 17 through the end. So it, a lot of this chapter he's dealing with his enemies, but, but notice that David is not dealing out of an attitude of vengeance. David is not dealing with, uh, with his enemies out of this attitude, I want to get even. In fact, he just he's turning the whole situation over to God because he understands God's judgment. And I think during this time right now in our country, it is easy for us to become very upset and very angry. And people are getting angry and upset. I saw a clip this morning that, that was amazing to me, and I, I, I'm not sure where this was. I think it was in the state of New York, but I don't know. Somebody walked into a store without a mask on, and customers in the store lost their minds. And yelling and screaming at this person without a mask, and chased them out of the store. We, 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 live, we live in days where people just, they, they have no control, they, they, lose, they lose all composure very easily. There's a story that's making news right now about a couple of people in a park, in Central Park in New York. Uh, and a lady did not have her dog on the leash. And a gentleman took out, he told her, he said, he, she didn't want to put her dog on the leash. He said, put your dog on the leash. She said, I don't want to. He said, you do what you want to do, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and you're not going to like what I do. And he had dog treats in his bag to pull, to, to lure her dog to him. And apparently he's done this before. And it just blew up, and they both blew up, and she called the cops, and it's just ridiculous. We live in a day and age where people think it is okay to take things into their own hands, to take matters in their own hands and just do whatever. David didn't do that. And, 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 and truth be known, David probably had more reason to do that than we do. And he didn't do it. He turned it over to the Lord. Notice verse 7 says, But the Lord shall endure forever. See, he changes the whole tone of the psalm when he says, But the Lord. I, my whole pastor used to teach me when you're reading the Bible and you see the word but, and then you see man after it, mark it down, something bad is going to happen. But when you see the word but and God is after that, something good is going to happen. It's just a little thing, a little item that you can use in your Bible reading to kind of track what's going on. So I want you to see some truths, some very simple truths about judgment and the judgment of the Lord. Number one, judgment is the Lord's. This is his domain. This is his area. It's not mine. It's not yours. Now, there are several ver words that are used here several times. Judge, judgment, uh, judged. And we look at it in the English language. Well, are they all mean the same? Well, they, they, they don't. They all have kind of the same general idea, but their actual meanings uh, change a little bit. If we see here, look at verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. The word judgment here means formal decree. Picture God sitting on the throne giving formal decree. And I think of stories in the Bible for example, dealing with the Persian Empire that conquered the Babylonian Empire, and the Jews lived under that for some time. The Babylonian, or the, the Persian Empire had this law that when the king made a decree, it could not be changed. He, you find that the king in Esther, in the book of Esther, gave Haman the opportunity to make a decree that called for the extermination of the Jewish people. That couldn't be changed. Even when the plot was found out and, and Mordecai was promoted and Haman was hanged, uh, 
the, the king Ahasuerus could not change the decree, so what he had to do was he had to give another decree to counteract the first decree, but that decree was in place. There were people in the end of the book of Esther that were going to rise up against the Jews, and they were going to try to carry out that first decree. Well, it's kind of like the same thing with God. When God gives a decree, folks, it's not going to change. Can I show you God's formal decrees? It's right here. The Word of God. The Bible says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God does not change his word. He does not go back on his word. Uh, we, we have, for example, in the Bible, and we could go through a lot of them. I won't tonight for time. But just here's a formal decree. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. There is no way around that. That is a formal decree of God on the sin of mankind. His word, as a formal decree, his word holds the worlds together. Look, we live in a day and age where everybody's all worried about the environment. And I'm not talking about trashing the environment. You know, we have, we have this 16-year-old girl from a foreign country come over here and, and boo-hoo and cry about global warming and all this sort of stuff. You know what? The environmentalists are not in control of anything. The politicians are not in control of anything. Do you know what's holding this world together? His formal decrees. Listen to 2 Peter 3 and verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The only reason this world doesn't fly into a million little pieces is because God's word is holding this place together. I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican, they're not in control of this. The one that's in control is the one that formed the world, and he's holding it together with the spoken word, with his formal decree. So, first of all tonight, we understand that judgment is the Lord's. Notice, secondly, in verse 8, the nature of his judgment. The nature of his judgment. It says, and he shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Now, let's define some things here. We see the word judge here, and that same word in the Hebrew is used again in verse 19. But this word judge means to pronounce sentence, to give a verdict. It, it, it's, it's the same as in our court system when a judge hears, maybe he hears the, uh, uh, hears everything by himself, all the evidence and everything. is a trial by a judge, and he, he declares the defendant guilty. He's pronouncing a sentence on him, and when he... When the verdict comes in, maybe the jury gives the verdict, and then the judge, the, the judge then says, I sentence you to 11 years. That's, he's pronouncing a judgment, a sentence. That's what this word is here in verse 8. And, and then he says in verse 8, he shall minister judgment. This is not the pronouncing of a sentence or a verdict. This is executing the law or ruling so it gives us a full picture of what God does. God, on the one hand, sits on the throne, gives formal decrees, because judgment is his, and then he gives, he pronounces sentences, he gives out verdicts, and then he carries it out. All of the word of God is God's word. We can call it all judgments. Psalm 119, many times David refers to the word of God as judgments. Understand this, God will carry out his word. But how does he do it? What is the nature of that? Does God ever do it out of hatred? Does God ever do it out of vengeance? Does God ever do it out of envy and jealousy? No. Look here. Look at the nature of his judgment. It says, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. That word righteous means what is morally right. Not what man thinks is right. Righteousness is determined by God. Right and wrong is determined by Almighty God, not the whims of man, not by society. It, it, society's standards goes up and down. So you, you can never figure out exactly where they stand on things because what they agreed with last week, they'll change next week. And by the way, we don't base right and wrong on the, listen to this statement very carefully, public policy. You know what public policy is? You hear a lot about that in politics. And you hear a lot of federal judges and state judges 
making statements and making judgments based on public policy. All that means, all that public policy means is what the general public believes and thinks. Well, we all know that changes. Our founding fathers never intended for us to make decisions about our country on public policy. That's why they wrote the Constitution. We make decisions based on the Constitution. By the way, Christian, you and I should make decisions in our life based on this document. Not based on what's popular today. Not based on what Christians think today. I saw an article today, I, I don't know the group, but there's a Christian band that their lead singer came out today and, or this week or something said he no longer has faith in God, no longer believes in God. Well, I don't care what he believes. That's sad that he would say that, that he's been singing and, and, and all this stuff for however long he's doing it. It's his form of music I wouldn't listen to, but nonetheless, he claims to be a Christian. He claims to be ministering and music and all that, and now all of a sudden he doesn't believe in God. I don't care. If he decides he doesn't believe in God, it doesn't change the truth of God's Word. If somebody decides they're going to walk away from the church and do what they want to do, and they're very popular and, and everybody likes them, it doesn't change one iota of what the Word of God says. It's not based on the whims of men. It's not based on what society standards are. It's not based on public policy. The judgment is based upon God's righteousness. What God says is morally right and morally wrong. He also says here that he shall minister judgment. He will execute the law. He'll carry the law out according to, he says, to the people in uprightness. Again, this is God's idea of uprightness. God does not respond in kind. God is always going to do what is right. Maybe the other side gets very upset. Maybe the enemies of God get very upset. They say slanderous things. God is still going to do the right thing all the time. That's the nature of his judgment. That's who he is. That's how he does things. Well, that ought to comfort our heart. When God does something in our life, when God moves in our life, maybe God allows a trial or a trouble to come into our life. God isn't doing that just because. God is always right in what he does. And we can tell on him. And we can depend on him. And we can trust him when everything is going wrong. Because his judgment is righteousness and upright. And so we see the judgment is the Lord's. We see the nature of his judgment. I'm so glad the nature of his judgment doesn't depend on what society thinks. They're just, it's up and down. It's up and down. And then lastly, look at verse 16. The Bible says his judgment here is greater than man's. Look at verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion, Selah. Now that word hideon means meditation. And then the word sila is that musical term that says take time to tune your instrument. So it's kind of like check yourself right here. Make sure you're lining up with it. So David is doing a double emphasis here. He says really think about this. Take some time and line yourself up with this truth. Well what truth is this? The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The word judgment here is the same as the word judgment in verse 7. The Lord is known by the formal decrees that he carries out. He is always going to operate according to his word. In the mind of God, he's lifted up his name high above everything else, but the one thing he's lifted higher than his name is his word. And so the Bible says the Lord is known by the judgment which he executes. God is, is known by what he does. It's part of who he is. The idea of justice is not just something that God does. It is something that God is. It is a part of his being. You can no more take justice away from God than you can take love away from God. 
You can no more take justice away from God than you can take holiness away from God. If you take justice away from God, he ceases to be God. If you take love away from God, he ceases to be God. If you take holiness away from God, he ceases to be God. This is who he is. And his judgment is higher than man's. God is very concerned that he is right. And sometimes we can rely on that. There's a story in the Bible in Genesis 18 that illustrates that truth. In Genesis 18, God and a couple of angels uh, meet with Abraham in his tent and he prepares food for them and all that and then the two angels leave and go on and God is talking to Abraham and, and God makes this statement in Genesis 18, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I shall do? In other words, God knows what he's about to do in Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19. And, and God has the heart. I can't do that without sharing or talking to Abraham. By the way, that's the heart of God. God is going to judge the world for sin. But he's not going to do it until he shares the idea with us, which is what he has done. He's given us the gospel so that we can share the gospel with others and we can warn them before judgment comes. That's who God is. And so God explains to Abraham what he's going to do. When Abraham hears that, he asks God if God would spare the area for 50 righteous men. And he says this in Genesis 18, verses 24 and 25. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Listen to what he says. That be far from thee to do after this matter. To slay the righteous with the wicked, and the righteous shall be as the, that the righteous shall be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now. Abraham wasn't challenging God. And Abraham didn't think that he had a right to put God in a box and dictate to God what he's going to do. There's a theology out there that does that. But Abraham knew who God was. He knew how God operated. And so Abraham said, Lord, I know you've got a judge, but if there's 50 righteous people there, will you spare judgment for them? It's not in your character to slay the righteous with the unrighteous. And you know what God did? He said, I'll spare it for 50. And then Abraham and God went back and forth to finally God said, would you spare it for 10? And God said, I'll spare it for 10. The sad thing is, they couldn't find 10 righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, judgment, God's judgment is greater than man's. You see, look at, look at the last part of this verse. The Bible says the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Man's judgment can often become a snare to him. When man operates by his sense of right and wrong, he, he gets things all mixed up. Uh, we, we, one of the things in this whole lockdown, shelter in place thing that's been troubling for a lot of people, and rightfully so, is that churches have been closed, but abortion clinics have been open. And man thinks that they're right in that. And there are those that even say that abortion is essential and is part of health care. And it's not. But you know what's going to happen with those that have that kind of judgment? One day they're going to be tracked by that. Listen to Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16. Where David said, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Thy substance was not hid from thee when I was in, made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, which means not complete. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. The moment that a child is conceived, God writes a record of that child. He, he writes down male or female. He writes down the color of eyes. How many fingers? How many toes? All of those things. He's got an apt, apt description of that child. 
He says here, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. He says later on, uh, in thy book all of my members were written in it, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Before mom even knew that she was carrying a child, God knew all about that child. I personally believe. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that the dead, the unsaved, are going to stand before God and the books are going to be open. There's a book written here. It says, in thy book, all my memories were written. There's a book where all these babies are recorded. And those people who have been responsible for the abortions of millions and millions and millions of children, God's going to start reading. I think he's just going to read the scriptures and judge them. They're making judgments right now that what they're doing is right. The state of New York or the city of New York passed some very, very liberal abortion laws and they celebrated that. They won't celebrate this great right from judgment. And so we see that judgment is God's. We see that the nature of his judgment is righteousness. We see that his judgment is greater than man. So let me close with just very quickly some, some closing application. God's word, what we call the Bible, is his decree on everything. You want to know what God is thinking? Right here. We, we teach in school, for example, sometimes kids are like, I don't like math. Well, why do we have to do math? Because we're dealing with the thoughts of God when we deal with numbers. God expresses his thoughts in numbers. He used numbers to tell Noah how big to build the ark. He used numbers to give to Moses the dimensions of all the furniture of the, the, of the tabernacle. He has a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. He tracks numbers. The Bible says that even the hairs of our head are numbered. The numbers of our hairs, he knows them. God expresses his thought with numbers. We've had others that say, well, I don't like English. Well, what are we talking about? Words? How does God express his thoughts? Words? When we're learning English and learning grammar, we're dealing with the thoughts of God. Uh, what about history? It's called His story. Everything we're learning is about God. God is the source of all truth. God's word is His decree on everything. Secondly, justice is part of who God is. Therefore, we can trust Him to always be right. God allows something. I, I, my heart is broken over my niece, Hilda. Can't imagine. I, I can't imagine what she's going through tonight. Getting ready to have a surgery. When she comes out of that surgery, she won't have her left eye. I don't understand that. Breaks my heart. But I know this, God is still right. I don't understand what God is doing through this. I don't know what God, God will give glory to himself somehow through this. There'll be victory in this somewhere. I don't understand it, but I know this, God is right. I don't understand what's going on in our world right now. There's a lot of side issues with this whole pandemic, and we can get into all that, but I know this, God is right. And what God is doing is right. And then lastly, and this statement is just tremendously true, and, 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 and it's a great source of comfort for me. We are better off in the hands of God than in the hands of men. David, when he numbered the children of Israel at the end of his reign, God gave him three punishments. And he chose pestilence rather than he, he, he chose to allow God to go through the land. Because he said this, I'd rather be in the hand of God. Who knows but what God will be merciful. He said, but you can't count on men. I'm paraphrasing. But that was his idea. You know what he's saying? I'm better off in the hands of God than I am in the hands of men. Hey, Christian, listen to me. Right now, tonight, you're in the hands of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. We are tonight in the hands of God. 
Whatever happens with coronavirus, we're in the hands of God. Whatever happens with the politicians, we're in the hands of God. Whatever happens with the environment, we're in the hands of God. And I'd rather be in the hands of God than in the hands of men. Because in his judgment, God is always right. And we can count on it. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for each one that is a part of the service. We have some here, others that are watching live stream. We have a number of folks in our church that are battling illness and health issues. Ms. Kate's home, Ms. Laura's in the hospital. Mrs. Keel has some joint pain. Brother Doug Bryan is recovering from surgery. Rebecca's grandma and grandpa's heart issues. And, and then Lord, on top of that, there's untold, unknown, other issues we had unspoken prayer requests shared tonight and there may be financial burdens and issues there may be different kinds of issues and stress and what have you but Lord we know that you're always right we know that we can count on you Lord I know a few people in this world that are not dependent upon you they're counting on themselves and they're constantly in a state of turmoil and stress and anxiety because they're trying to figure it out by themselves. Lord, when I, in my own personal life, lean on me, I get the same way. I don't have to do that. You're there. The Bible still tells us, casting all your care upon him, for he care for you. The Bible still tells us that you never sleep, you never slumber. So, Father, tonight, would you help? Would you help us to understand this tremendous doctrine of justice and judgment? It's who you are. May we find great comfort in that tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Now our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed. Miss Hannah's going to play a little bit of a song of invitation tonight. But as you're there in your home and you bowed your head before God and Maybe even out of your heart to him, you realize that you've maybe been leaning upon yourself instead of on God. A pastor friend of mine wrote a, a post, put a post out, I think it was last week, how one of the things he's learning through this whole thing is dependence upon God. That's a good thing. Tonight, what are you depending upon? Are you depending upon your ability, your wisdom? Are you depending upon what society is doing? Or are you depending upon a God that never changes and a God that's always right? Would you right now just say, God, I, I, I need your help. I need to rely on you and depend upon you and not the world around me and not myself. Would you just dedicate yourself to me? You seal decisions in hearts tonight. May we be very careful to be dependent upon you, knowing that your judgment, your justice is always right. Father, thank you for this message. You, you, you spoke to my heart tonight, and I needed this. I pray you'd help each one tonight through this message. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we go tonight, a reminder, come by tomorrow night between 5.30, 6.30, pick up the, 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 the information I'll have. I'll have a list of what group you're in, even a seating chart so you kind of know where you're going to be sitting, and, and, uh, and some other information for you. So come by tomorrow night for that. If you would, that would be a help. I would appreciate it. Give me a chance to say hi to you. And so if you do that, I'd appreciate that. And I want you to play a little bit for us tonight.